Let's open our Bibles, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1. You know, we remain standing for a few minutes in honor of the reading of God's Word. Deuteronomy, chapter 1, from verse 19 to 27. Deuteronomy, chapter 1. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible, part of the Torah, written by Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 19. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So we, depart, so we departed from Horeb and went through all that great terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the mountains of the Amorites, as the Lord our God had commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea, verse 20. And I said to you, you have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Lord, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. As the Lord God of your of your fathers has spoken to you, do not fear or be discouraged. And every one of you came near to me and said, let us send some men before us. Let, us, let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us the way by which we should go up and of the cities into which we shall come. The plan pleased me well. Verse 23, the plan pleased me well. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe, and they departed and went up into the mountains and came to the valley of Eshkelon and spied it out. They also took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it to us. And they brought back word to us, saying, it is a good land which the Lord our God is giving us. Nevertheless, you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you complained in your tents and said, because the Lord hates us. He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. In Jesus' name we read, amen. Please have your seats. <clears throat> the title of the sermon today is a good idea, good, and a God idea. So what's the difference? And we want to look at scripture. The difference between a good idea and a God idea. Now, there's a world of difference. It's like day and night. A good idea, the concept is born in our mind. And a good idea is like you go into a community and you realize that they don't have a green grocer, or a supermarket, and the community is growing, and so you, you start a supermarket there. And it grows. You do your, you know, your, your market research, you deal with consultants, and you look at the inflow of people and the human traffic, and you know, it's a good idea. But a God idea is when God sends you to a place where there is no one, they're just wild animals, and he tells you to buy a piece of land there and build a supermarket in the middle of nowhere. Because God knows one day a road will come by and the people will begin to come. And because you will never be able to afford land in a developed area, God sends you there when land still costs nothing because no one wants it. And by the time you're going there, even you are doubting whether it is God. Because even the little that that land costs, you have sought legal counsel. In a sense, you have sought a loan. And you have remortgaged your house so that you can build the supermarket there where they're just hyenas. But God knows that one day a major road will pass by there. Hallelujah. And you will be the first supermarket where everyone will buy. And then people will be asking, how did you even come here? You are just a simple teacher. How did you ever have 20 acres here 
Yeah, when the land was costing nothing. When no one else would have bought the land there. Now, many of us want to go where it's happening. But how many of us want to go when God says go? Because when it's God's idea, he doesn't say much. And I'm going to draw you a plan, a, a parallel of two men who heard from God, Abraham and Moses. Both, the purpose is to get the people of God into the promised land. Moses received the promise, he came on the land, he saw it, and he believed. And he died and was buried on the promised land. Moses was supposed to bring the people of God into the promised land. In between, it's close to 500 years. Between Moses and Abraham. Moses saw it, never stepped it. He never got there. So what is this he did? What is the difference between Moses and Abraham? Because God refers to Moses as my faithful, humble servant. But this faithful, humble servant didn't make it to the land. He didn't make it home. He never made it to the promised land. So what happened and how is it different from Abraham? Interestingly, Moses was set apart from birth. And Moses was born in a turbulent time. Because the devil knows the vision in him and the purpose of Moses. So there was turbulence, just like it was many years later in the times of Jesus Christ. Because the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the devil hasn't changed his ammo or ammunition, ammo. And so by the time that Moses was being born, there were too many Jews. And Pharaoh thought, you know what, we need to kill all these people. So Pharaoh consults or instructs the midwives. And he says... Every time a Jewish child is born, kill them at birth. But the Jewish women feared God. I mean, the, 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 the Egyptian uh, housewives feared God, and so they didn't kill these children. So they continued to live. And so they went further and now started going into the houses and killing them now. And so Moses' mother made like a small, they actually called Moses baskets, eh? I don't know what they were called before Moses. <laughs> Baby baskets. <laughs> and she went and hid her son on the river Nile. That is how desperate the situation was. It's between a rock and a hard place. Who, which normal woman would take her child and leave her by the river? No one. But God is amazing. The same Pharaoh who's killing children, the daughter finds Pharaoh, I mean, finds Moses, and Moses, a Jewish boy, grows up in Pharaoh's home as a prince. As in, only God can do things like that. So anyway, Moses grows up. Remember, he has been set apart from birth. Moses has no idea that God has set him apart. That's why he didn't die with all the other children, his age mates. So he grows up as a prince, and the mother does a good job. He makes him never forget that he's a, yes, you're a prince, but you're Jewish. So at 40, he kills an Egyptian, and he runs away. He goes into the Midian country, into the wilderness. He gets married to Jethro's daughter, and he lives there for 40 years. And he's not ambitious because he's lying low. In fact, the Bible says, when the burning bush, when God found him at the burning bush, he didn't have anything to his name. Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep. In 40 years, he had acquired nothing. This guy was lying low. God calls him at the age of 80. Set apart from birth. But at 80, God says, it's time to fulfill your purpose in life. I want to send you to go and deliver the children of Israel and bring them to the promised land. He starts to negotiate. He says, who will I tell them send me? And God gives him props. Use your stick. It turns into a snake. 
His hand is shriveled and then it's healed. And he says, I will even send you your brother Aaron, who you haven't seen in 40 years. Why? Because Moses is saying, I bleed like a sheep. He's just bringing excuses. He doesn't want to go. Now, on the other side, here is a man who has no idea. He's just living his best life now. He doesn't have a son. He has a wife, a father, and a nephew called Lot. God calls him at the age of 75. And he says, I want you to leave home and go to a land I will show you. So he packs, he manages to convince his wife that we are going to a place that has no destination. That's an uphill task. <laughs> and I want you to imagine three months down the road, they've been walking, and Sarah asks Abraham, Mukiongiana God, alikuambia tunaenda? Are we near? Now, about 10 years ago, I was going for a wedding of one of our members here, who was an usher, in Rwanda. So we went by road. When we got to Nakuru, we are going to Rwanda. When we got to Nakuru, my boy started asking, are we halfway? <laughs> <laughs> by the time we got to Kisumu, how many more hours, daddy? We are in Kenya. They couldn't grasp that concept that we are still in Kenya. We have to cross Uganda to get to <coughs> to Rwanda. And then, <coughs> when we get to Rwanda, we have to go to Kigali. You know, you can be in Kenya, like in Ukobusia, and you Nairobi. <laughs> so when we cross Busia, to them, now we have left Kenya. Oh, so we are there now. No, 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 no. We have just left Kenya. We've entered Uganda. We still have to drive for a whole day in Uganda. A whole day, daddy, yes. So how will we know we are there? When it gets to night. <laughs> when you see it's night, you know we are? So every time they would ask me, they, is it night? No. Is it night? No. Unfortunately, it got to night when we were crossing the border at Katuna in Rwanda. So we are there. No, we got a bit delayed. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to imagine the conversation that Abraham and Sarah are having about where God is sending Abraham. And Sarah is asking very good wife questions. When you are talking to God, alikuambia huko tunaenda kunaitwa. Is that is that a good wife question? Huko tunaenda kunaitwa? Ndio tujue ni how far? Ndio nijipange na chakula. You know, but that conversation is not recorded. Abraham is a wise man. Hallelujah. So anyway, they had that conversation. And at this point, Abraham has his father and Lot. His father died midway. He's buried. And God is blessing this man because he obeyed. He didn't ask questions. He just woke up and left. There is a blessing that comes with obedience. And obedience is either absolute or it's not. Hallelujah, I will repeat that. Obedience is either or it's. So Abraham hits the road. Now they become so wealthy and so big, and Lot is blessed because of Abraham. They get to a point where their own workers decide, you know what, we can't coexist. You go left, I go right. So Abraham brings out a preposition. You go left, I go right. You go south, I go north. But you choose first. So Lot looks around and he sees Sodom and Gomorrah. It's lush. So he hits the road. And it's interesting because God only spoke to him when he called him. But all this time after he has left, God doesn't speak to him. It's until Lot leaves that now God speaks to Abraham again. That same day, God tells Abraham, lift up your eyes. As far as you can see, this land is yours forever, and still is to date. And that promise held because Abraham was buried there, and he, borrow, he bought it in his heart that when he got his first son Isaac, when he got Isaac, Abraham made his servant 
His head servant Eliaza, swear to me, <coughs> swear that you will never take my son back. He told him, you go get a wife for my son. It's critical that he does get a wife. He's 40. But even if you don't, never take my son back. That is a greater problem than not having a wife or even marrying a heathen wife. Never go back. Abraham was buried. Abraham's grave is in the promised land. He died there. Abraham died a wealthy man. His generations are talked about for years before and for years after. And even after we are gone, if Jesus tarries, they will talk about Abraham for thousands of generations to come. Moses, on the other hand, after he died, he died with his name. No one knows about his, we know about his children, but they were never anything. Never affected life. Both called, both connected to the promised land and the fulfillment of that promise. But one fulfills his purpose. Absolute obedience. The other one questions. And it's at verse 23, NIV. Verse 23, NIV, chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible says this. The idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12. Now, let me give you context <clears throat> of verse 23. God has performed amazing miracles in Egypt. The children of Israel have left. And God has avenged all the children that died in Egypt. You remember all the children that were killed at birth in Egypt. God has avenged them. How? How? All the firstborns of Egypt died on the same day. Beast and man. One day. Before the children of Israel left Egypt, he avenged the death of those children. Every home had someone die. In certain homes, more than one. If I was in Egypt... It would mean me, Pastor Caro, and TJ. Because I'm a firstborn, Pastor Caro is a firstborn, and TJ is our firstborn. It was so sad because there was death and no one to comfort. Death was smelling in the air. Nandiyo nawambi aivi. God is a consuming fire. Fear him. Fear him. Fear him. So the children of Israel leave. And they go into the wilderness. Now who's guiding them? Moses has never been to the promised land, so he has no idea the way. But God is with them. By day, there's a cloud that gives them shade because he's still in the Middle East. By night, a pillar of fire. So we get to verse 23. God has been guiding them, and he has fought all their battles. He has removed all the obstacles that they have to the promised land. He's fulfilling the promise. And then verse 23, was I, was Israel, was I come up with a good idea? Good idea. Now, remember, good idea is logic. And it sounds good, but it's not of God. So what happens? He says, the idea seemed good. And what was the idea? Let us pick one person representing every tribe and let them go do what God is supposed to be doing for us because God is supposed to go before us to scout the land. So let us remove God. And remember, even as they are having this discussion, if it's during the day, they are enjoying the cloud that God has given them a shade. If it's at night, there's a pillar that is keeping them warm as they are deliberating how they will ditch God. <laughs> They've just eaten manna. Wacha tukule kwanza, I love to onge. The manna that God has given them so that they can have a good idea and ditch God's idea. And then they pick 12. Those 12 go into the, into the 
into the country. And when they get there, surprise, surprise, they bring back a record of the fact that, you know what, there are cities that have walls to the, to the sky. And we have people who are nine feet tall. Everything they said was true. Unfortunately, it created a sense of desperation and fear in the camp. But you see, this battle wasn't theirs. This was God's battle. It was God who was going to fight those enemies for them. Whether they are nine feet or ten feet tall, it, you, they weren't an enemies of Israel. They were enemies of God. It was God who was going to remove them and give them the land. And now here they are taking the responsibility upon themselves. And now they are sending it and they are saying, Why? These guys will eat us alive. We look like grasshoppers in their eyes, which is true. And so what do they do? They go back into their tents and they start complaining and they say, God hates us. He brought us to the Amorites to just throw us so that he can be destroyed. Literally, they are accusing God of malice. Our God is not malicious. So this happens at Kadesh Barnea. So what happens at Kadesh Barnea? That's where they make that decision. And they grumble in their tents. God is so angry. He tells them, Everyone above 20 will never see the promised land. So at Kadesh Barnea, instead of crossing over, and the Jordan is not too far away, they turn now and they go back into the desert for 38 years. 38 years. By the time they are showing back up at Kadesh Barnea, everyone who was above 20 is dead. Is dead. Except Joshua and Caleb. So here you are. So how does this relate to you? God gives you an idea. And this idea is overwhelming because God just gives you an idea. He doesn't give you the nitty gritties. But you see, a good idea is systematic. You have plans. I resign here. I get money from here. I rent a house. I build this. I do this. You know, it's, it's, it's logical. You can see where you're going. The projections, you can present them to the bank as your projections and they give you money because it's logical. But you take a faith statement to God. I want you guys to give me money in the bank. What are you going to do? Start a business. Where's your projections? I don't have. I just know God told me to go. Let's see how many of them will give you money. <coughs> bank kupatia 10 million. Because unataka kuanza kabiashara kite. Eh tuone. Alafu waambie, hauna projections. I want bank details, nothing. I want market research, I want market survey. You're just there. God, I'm in Yambia. Oh, I'm going to be here. But i Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see, that's where things went south. In verse 37 of chapter 1, this is Moses giving a report. He says this. The Lord was so angry with me for your sake saying, even you shall not go in there. Ata wewe Musa hauta ingia. God was so angry because you listened to these people and I told you to lead them. Even you won't go in. And I remember God speaking to me this sermon in 2018. In January 2020. Uh, 2019. That we shall build by the spirit of God our faithfulness. Just tithe is enough. If everyone was to tithe faithfully, we'll build. No fundraising. And now, one more floor, and we are done with the tower. He has been faithful. He has been faithful. Hallelujah. He has been faithful. If all of us were to tithe faithfully, not just this building, but would build even the other six churches in Jesus' name. So Moses messed up. And it didn't just cost him. It cost everyone else. And I want to tell you this. When you miss God, it affects everyone, even your children. Even the generations that come after you. Pay for your bad decisions. And that's the truth. He missed God. So as a, as a believer... We do not have the luxury of missing God. We don't. You can't afford not to hear God. And that's why prayer cannot be an event. It must be a way of life. <clears throat> Friends, 
As a youth pastor, I used to use this analogy. And I used to ask the young people, so you've just cleared campus. One guy gets a job with the UN. He's a professional. In nine months, he gets a car, he gets red plates, and he lives in the leafy suburbs. The next guy, who's also an engineer, both, he didn't get the job at the UNEP. But there's a missionary in church that Sunday that says, you know what? We've started a school in the northern frontier district of Mandera. There is no water and there is no electricity. But we want someone, because we can't afford to pay them, to be employed as an engineer by government so that when you leave work in the afternoon, you can be teaching the children for free. And because we can't afford other teachers, you will be teaching everything. When you learn English, geography, maths, chemistry, when you learn English, so this one guy decides, Sour, I will go to Mandera, NFD, Northern Frontier District, and I will be a teacher there. So these two guys come to the graduation bash. A few months later, this one is working in the UN. He has red plates, he has a nice SUV, and he lives in the leafy suburbs. And he has to give his reports every three months in New York. At the United Nations head office. So who do you think will marry the prettiest girl in the class? <laughs> the engineer in the, in the NFD or the engineer who's working for the UNEP? Who do you think married the prettiest girl in the class? The UN guy, eh? I guess your guess is as good as, as mine. So missionary, na engineering yake yote, NFD. So he gets there, finds another commissionary who's also teaching Sunday school. And early childhood, they get married. And uh, halfway through, 15 years down the road, he decides, you know what, I'm not leaving this place. I love it. I may not have a lot to show, but heaven knows my name. So he buys a hundred acres of land. He builds a house as an engineer. And he starts drilling water so that he can start farming because retirement is not too far. So he starts drilling. He goes a hundred meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, 400 meters, 450 meters. Rather than heat water, he heats oil. He heats oil on his land. And now he can buy the UN. <laughs> he can buy the UN. He's an oil baron now. He doesn't fly commercial. He has a jet. He doesn't even land commercial. He has a runway. <laughs> Because when you have oil, you own the nation. Hallelujah. Now, I used to ask the young people there, which of you would choose the latter rather than the former? And the truth is 99.9% .9 would pick the UN job, but they would want the benefits of the oil baron. But you know the truth on life is this. You can't make your bed and lie on it. You can't bake your cake and, and eat it. So the decisions are key. And God will always give us ideas. God will always give us a roadmap. Unfortunately, I'm telling you this today. He doesn't give you the whole picture. He just speaks of today. So you obey today, he will give you the new instructions tomorrow. And so you have nothing to show. Abraham had nothing to tell the wife 
alikuambia huko tunaenda kunaitwa alisema tu uenda na huku muuliza next time akikuongelesha niite any wife in the house next time akikuja unifanya nini uniite ni muulize huko tunaenda kunaitwa kunaitwaje <laughs> haleluya any married men who have no answers <laughs> Can you imagine Noah? <laughs> Can you imagine Noah? Noah, eh? we know they were there for 100 and f- close to 159, 160 days. Can you imagine on the fourth month, Noah's wife is being asked by his sons, who are being asked by the daughters in law, Mom, tume, tume fika wapi sai? Because we've been here for four months. Tushatoka, I, I, are we in Europe or are we in Africa? Are we in America? Are we in Australia? As in, where are we? And what was the answer from Noah? I don't know. So, tunaenda side gani? Sijui. Tutafika lini? Sijui. Tutaka hapa siku ngapi? Sijui. Unajua nini? Najua mungu waliniambia, tuingia hapa ndani na akafunga. <laughs> Na haja kuongelesha tena hapana. Na uoni ni kama alikusare. <laughs> Bado mkona he, ebu jichunguze. Mino na ukona thambi wewe. Ebu jichunguze. Na we all know here that after they got out of the boat, the first thing Noah did was plant a vineyard. Sindio? He planted a? And when it grew, what did he do? He drank. So we know he didn't get that habit in the boat. He got it before. So alikuwa kalewa. So the wife must have been asking. Siku hiyo akikuambia ulikuwa kalewa. Thank God for wives. Amen. Friends. I don't know how many of you here today are in the valley of decision making. You're here today and you're saying, God, I need to make a decision. I must make this decision. But the reason you're stuck is because you're saying, God, what are you saying about this? So you're here and in the valley of decisions today. Number one, invest your time in prayer. Number two, let your Bible be your best friend because God still speaks. Number three, block out the noise. Block out the noise. It's until Lot walked away that God spoke to him. Block out the noise. Create time for God. Make time to pray. Prayer can't just be an event. It must be a way of life. Because maybe he's speaking, you're just not hearing. But I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, in that situation that you are in where you're saying, God, where should I go? Should I invest here? Should I invest there? Should I buy this? Should I buy the other? I don't know what, but I know God does. So in that valley of decisions, the altar is open. Come and let the Lord speak to you because he still does.